Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back for more World War II submarine history with Haiku and our topic for today, the German Type II U-boat. Um, we'll briefly talk about where this type of submarine fits on the spectrum, and then um, we're going to talk about the events leading up to its development. Um, there will be some technical tables at the end of the briefing. As always, feel free to pause it at any time if you want to study a slide. The coastal or littoral zone of an ocean um, is an area close to the shore and extends out to the edge of the continental shelf. Coastal submarines are small and maneuverable with shallow draft, well suited to navigation of coastal areas, channels, and harbors. Space limitations aboard coastal submarines limit fuel, food, and weapons, which in turn limits them to short patrol times, typically 7 to 30 days. Considering these limitations, coastal submarines are still valuable as they are able to reach areas inaccessible to larger submarines and can be more difficult to detect considering their size and the nature of the uh, environment around them. Now, during World War I, the advantages of rapid construction and portability encouraged development of the UB torpedo launching and the UC mine laying coastal submarines in 1915. Uh, to operate in the English Channel. These coastal submarines displaced only 15 to 20 percent the weight of a conventional U-boat, but they could be built in one quarter of the time it took to complete the larger seagoing U-boats. So one of the essential conditions um, of the cessation of hostilities of World War I was the delivery of the U German U-boat fleet to Britain. And to add insult to injury, the future development, production, and possession of submarines by Germany was also prohibited by the treaty. Now, while the requirements of the Treaty of Versailles had delivered a decisive blow to the hopes of Germany eventually rebuilding its U-boat fleet, one loophole, one loophole in the treaty was that it did not require Germany to either destroy or turn over to the Allies existing design and construction information related to U-boats. And it was through this loophole the Reichsmarine and the German shipyard saw an opportunity to continue the, the uh, development of the U-boat through clandestine means. So in 1921, Argentina reached out to former German naval officers and civilian naval architects for assistance in the development and construction of 10 submarines for its Navy. This would ultimately lead to the German Navy asking several German shipyards to form a consortium in order to undertake this in future projects. It was still a problem um, that the Treaty of Versailles prohibited German companies from engaging in, in any activity related to submarines. Um, the shipyards would solve this problem by establishing a design firm in a foreign country controlled by them and the Reichsmarine. So here we go. I'm going to try to pronounce this I tried to get find someone in my warships clan who spoke Dutch, but no joy. So anyways, um, enter stage right, the NV Ingenieurs Cantor voor Sheep's Bow, which means engineer uh, office for shipbuilding, just usually contracted to uh, IBS in 1922. In 1924, the Finnish government approached IVS with an interest in a small mine lane submarine for use on Lake Lagoda. IVS offered several designs to Finland over the next five years before they finally agreed in 1929 to the construction of a prototype named Sakau, a 99-ton submarine with a crew of 13, carrying two torpedoes and up to, and up to nine mines. Finnish naval leaders were, satisf were satisfied with Sako, but it was realized that it was far too small to be of practical use in, in uh, open ocean waters. IVS followed up this design proposal with a small coastal defense submarine, and Finland agreed to the design and construction in 1930. At 254 tons, Pasico carried 16 crewmen with a range of 1,500 nautical miles at 10 knots surfaced, 50 nautical miles submerged at four knots, three, tor tor three torpedo tubes forward, carrying five torpedoes total, and a single 20 millimeter AA gun. 
Beginning in 1933, German naval planners and shipyards began discussing the secret construction of submarines directly for the Reichsmarine. In order to expedite the buildup of a new U-boat arm, it was envisioned a high-low mix of ocean-going and coastal submarines. For the coastal submarine program, planners looked to the previously built Vesico as the prototype for what would become the Type II U-boat program. The Type II Alpha was the first to be built in Germany since the end of World War I. They were able to be built fast in four to six months, uh, were strong and maneuverable. A well-trained crew of 25 could achieve a dive time of 25 seconds. They displaced 254 tons surfaced with a length of 40.9 meters and a 4 meter beam. Twin six-cylinder diesel engines providing 700 horsepower uh, to propel a surfaced boat up to 1600 nautical miles at 8 knots, 13 knots maximum. Likewise, twin electric motors provided 360 horsepower and gave a submerged range of 35 nautical miles at 4 knots with a 6 point knot maximum. Test depth was 150 meters. Um, something, yeah, something I'll note is that the, the diesels in this boat, probably a little bit underpowered. Those diesels would have benefited from supercharging, but it's not something that was uh, envisioned for this class. Um, the limited range and small torpedo capacity of these boats ensured short but frequent patrols, typically seven to 14 days. This did give the upside of ensuring that the crew mostly ate fresh food for the duration of a, of a patrol. Later versions, Bravo through Delta, uh, introduced additional fuel storage, improved electric motors, and additional batteries to increase surface range to 5,650 nautical miles and submerge to 56 nautical miles. All versions of the boat had three forward firing torpedo tubes, six torpedoes total. Up to 18 mines could be carried for mine lane operations. Deck armament varied slightly by hull, but was typically limited to one or two 20 millimeter cannon. Eventually snorkels would be added to a handful of the boats before war end, and a total of 50 boats were built under this class. In this picture, you'll notice the um, Naxos radar detector on top of the snorkel. You, you would have to have some sort of radar detector on top of your snorkel because the snorkel could still be picked up by radar. Um, it was harder, it had a much lower uh, return, but uh, it could still be picked up. And since you're at periscope depth when you're using your snorkel, you need that, you need that early warning so that you can get down to a deeper depth. During the war, these boats operated predominantly in German coastal waters, the British Isles between 1939 and 1940, and in the Baltic from the summer of 1941 and onwards. As well as conducting combat patrols, the Type II uh, served as a training platform and was typically the first command for captains fresh out of U-boat commander school. Small boats as they were, a few achieved great success during the early part of the war under the command of such legendary U-boat captains as Wolfgang Luth. Between January and October 1940, Luth managed to sink 64,185 tons of Allied shipping while commanding the U-9 and the U-138. Um, <laughs> fellow U-boat captains would do some office sniping at Luth. Um, because of his milk runs later in the war into the South Atlantic on, on the bigger boats. Um, but you know what, the fact that he was able to sink so much shipping in and around the British Isles in this dugout canoe, it's really remarkable. Six Type II Bravo U-boats uh, were transferred to the Black Sea between 1942 and 1943 where they operated against the Soviet Union until 1940, uh, excuse me, 1944. Uh, <laughs> how did they get there? This is a really, this is a really fascinating uh, story. And it goes like this. The process started in the German Kiel shipyards where the boats were disassembled as much as possible to lighten them. Once a boat was lightened, it would be put on its side on pontoon barges for river transport. The boats were towed down the Kiel Canal and the Elba River to Dresden, Germany, 
where they were lifted from the barges and placed onto special tractor trailers. While the boats moved overland via the Autobahn to Ingolstadt, Germany, their pontoon barges were transported by rail to meet them when they arrived. In Ingolstadt, uh, they were loaded back onto their pontoon barges to continue their journey down the Danube River to Linz, Austria. It was in Linz the boats were partially reassembled and once again they continued down the Danube to Galatz, Romania. So in Galatz, reassembly of the boats was completed and they sailed under their own power a short distance to Constanza uh, where they would operate against the Soviets. Three boats arrived in Constanza in October 1942 and another three in May 1943. The boats were used without loss in the Black Sea until Romania ceased active participation in the war. Success was mixed, uh, but they did exert an important operational pressure on Soviet naval forces, and they did sink supply ships and tankers. In uh, August 1944, one boat would be sunk in port by Soviet air power with another two damaged, and those would be scuttled by their crews not long after. The remaining three would be scuttled by their crews in September 1944, ending Germany's submarine presence in the Black Sea. One interesting innovation about the Type II boats was the use of the court nozzle around the propellers. A court nozzle, or ducted propeller, is a marine propeller fitted with a non-rotating nozzle developed first by Luigi Stippa in 1931 and later Ludwig Court in 1934. The court nozzle improves the overall efficiency of the propeller at low speeds below 10 knots. Above that speed, the inefficiency caused by the drag produced by the shroud exceeds the efficiency of the increased water flow through the propeller. And we're going to see that. I have a chart that will uh, support that. Okay, so we're at the point where we're basically wrapping up the brief. Um, I have three tables I want to share with you. Uh, they have technical inf they have uh, detailed technical information about the type 2 alpha. And then there is a chart as a comparison between the different subclasses and like with ships and you know probably airplanes, you get this mission creep so you have a contract for a boat or a plane and you realize that you need a little bit more of this or a little less of that and instead of like you know going out and designing a whole new frame you, you try to work with what you have and see how you can improve it but you can see here how um, the changes in the in the type 2 between the alpha and delta variants um, how that changes their um, mission the last table here is the one that I was really wanted to emphasize uh, this is like a fuel burn chart with the type 2 alpha through the type 2 delta uh, the first row is what's important for the type 2 alpha running at eight knots which is standard speed they would probably be running a little bit less than that most of the time but for this comparison we're using this we can see that uh, it has a fuel burn rate of 138 nautical miles per ton of fuel. Now look at the Type 2 Bravo. Its fuel burn rate is 180 nautical miles per ton. The Type 2 Alpha did not have the court nozzle. That was introduced with the Type 2 Bravo boats. And as we look across that row, we can see how the fuel burn rate for the Type 2 Charlie and Delta it's still higher than the Type 2 Alpha. And, uh, you know, that's that court nozzle effect. So it worked. So anyways, uh, that's it for today, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the briefing, and we'll come back again. Feel free to contact me via email. I am on Discord, Twitter, and I do have a Patreon. Special thanks to the United States Naval Institute for doing the job that they do so well. Their publishing arm is an invaluable resource to the preservation of naval history. Consider becoming a member so their work can continue long into the future. Till next time, peace out.